Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Patrick Milliken. I'm here with the Poison Pen Bookstore, and it is a real treat and an honor to welcome our good friend Ian Rankin here uh, on the, I guess, the eve of publication of his new book, terrific new book, and uh, kind of presciently titled uh, A Song for the Dark Times. And I have uh, an advanced reading copy here because we haven't even received our final copies yet. But I thought we'd start off, um, we've got on the screen here, well, first of all, welcome, Ian. Great to have you here, as always. Um, Thank you. And we've got here on the screen this cool little video that Barbara found. I'll go ahead and play it right now. Were you able to see any of that, Ian? No, man, I can't see anything. I can see me and I can see you. All right. I'm That's... not the most technologically um, able person, you know. I still have to put some coal into the back of my computer in the morning. Well, let's see. Can you see that uh, image? Oh, right? yeah, there you go. I can see that. So I thought Barbara said you might start by just describing some of these photos that you shared with us. So what are we looking yeah, at? Yeah, I mean, you know, lockdown came to Edinburgh um, just as I was starting the second draft of the book. So it was perfect timing in a way because I had nothing to do except write. But we were allowed one hour's exercise outside per day. And the streets of Edinburgh were completely empty. So this is walking up to the castle. And normally in the summer, uh, that would be absolutely packed out with, with tourists and visitors. You wouldn't be able to see the castle for people. And also they would be starting to think about building the scaffolding because that's also the site of the Edinburgh Tattoo, which happens every August, which is a big military um, kind of shindig, come jamboree, come parade. Uh, and if you live up that part of town, normally all you can see from your windows is scaffolding up to the height of the castle. So it was very strange to be able to walk up to the castle, nobody there, look down onto Princess Street, nobody there, and then just walk home again. So right, let's see here. What about this one? Okay, can you see that one? Uh, no, I've still got the same one. Maybe I should, shall I click see all photos? What would happen if I clicked see all photos? Let's see here. Let me try this again. Here we go. How about now? Oh yeah. Okay, so this is um, the Royal Mile, uh, the high street, which is up near the castle. So basically the castle is behind me as I take this photograph. And that is St. Giles Cathedral. Um, and so again, this is in August, in July, August, this is absolutely packed out with visitors, with tourists. There's all kinds of street theatre going on. Of course, we had no Edinburgh Festival this year, no Fringe Festival, no Book Festival, nothing was happening. So the streets were completely empty or almost completely empty. And it was just the most extraordinary thing. And I mean, as a crime writer, of course, like a lot of other writers, I was wandering around going, can I use this? <laughs> is there, it would just be an amazing backdrop to some kind of crime story. No, you can, it's just where, I, just to sh uh, add something, just where the blue scaffolding is there on the left, that's, right. kind of, that's pretty much the city chambers, which is our kind of council headquarters. And if you were to walk through the archway, which is covered up by the scaffolding, you would be in a kind of quadrant in front of the city chambers. And there are handprints there in the pavement of sort of celebrated recent Edinburgh folk. Um, and you'll find my handprints there right next to J.K. Rowling's. And she has got much smaller hands than me. <laughs> so in normal times, this would be a packed, vibrant street scene, right? Absolutely. This would be the be jugglers, there'd be sort of street performers, there'd be tables outside, people eating and drinking, people heading into the cathedral to look at the stained glass and the various bits and pieces. Uh, just behind the cathedral on the right-hand side are the law courts, so lots of lawyers and judges would be going in and out of there. Um, it's a really buzzy part of town and uh, empty, empty. It was an incredible privilege to walk around those streets. So what's it like right now? 
Uh, well, we've just entering a kind of semi lockdown now. Um, we've been told that uh, because the um, cases are going up again, that we're having to in Edinburgh, the, the central the central region of Scotland, everything from Glasgow to Edinburgh um, is having to lock down to a certain extent. So bars, restaurants have got to close. Um, if they are licensed, i.e. if they can sell booze, uh, they've just got to close. And some of the bars, some of my favourite bars in Edinburgh had literally just reopened, haven't been closed since March. And they'd spent a fortune on PPE, you know, everybody wearing visors, um, everybody getting tracked and traced, lots of kind of plastic shielding going up in the bar so that you, can, you, you know, you're not sitting next to anybody, there's a kind of barrier between you and them. Then they'd all gone and bought their new barrels of beer and stuff and got them all set up, uh, open for business. And a week later, they were told to close again. So it's pretty desperate. This is us looking up the high street again. This would be midsummer, I would think, June, July. Um, and that can inspire, you can see that as, again at St. Giles Cathedral. So we're the other side of this St. Giles Cathedral looking down before. Now we're looking back up towards the, the castle. It's just around the bend up the top. Um, and again, this, this is pedestrianised. This would be full of street performers, um, crowds of people watching them, lots of kids running around, lots of tourists with their phones out. Uh, the fringe office I can see just over those two telephone boxes is the Edinburgh fringe office so that's where people go to buy their tickets for all the Edinburgh festival shows in August. Again that was locked down, no point opening it up, there was no Edinburgh festival. So it, you know we went from a city that normally in the summer doubles in population um, to a city where you just didn't see anybody and all the students had gone home, there were no students, there were no tourists, all the hotels were locked up uh it was a ghost town man it was a ghost town i live in an apartment block and in my apartment block i swear my wife and i were the only people there um because it's a Are mixture you, uh, of airbnb and overseas students and no overseas students were there and no air airbnbs were allowed to operate so are these buildings kind of along the the left side of the screen there would they be what you're, you call tenement tenement yeah buildings? those are tenements so at ground level it's shops stores and then one, two, three, four, four, the four levels above would be, um, you know, sometimes it can be offices, but mostly it's um, apartments. Um, and they'll be rented, they'll be owner occupied, or they'll be Airbnbs. Uh, and the right hand side, again, is looking up towards the city chambers, and those are all council buildings. So that's where you go to, to pay parking fines and stuff like that is on the right hand side. And these, um, you know, the street, as you're looking at it there, um, I made a mistake in the first Rebus novel. I called those cobbles. You know, I thought those were cobbles, C-O-B-B-L-E-S. They're not. Uh, in, in Scotland, they're known as sets, S-E-T-T-S. -T -T so they're kind of rectangular. They're not rounded stones. They're kind of rectangular bricks. So uh, I made a mistake in the first book. So I never made that mistake again because I got told off. Now we are at the foot of the mound. The mound is uh, a road that links the, um, the high street where we were previously in the photographs coming down the steep um, street towards Princes Street, which is the main shopping street in Edinburgh. And it's got an interesting history of the mound because there used to be, what we're looking at is called the Old Town. The Old Town is the original medieval um, city. Uh, and then late 18th century, because it was becoming disreputable and unsanitary and overcrowded, they built the new town, which is kind of where I'm standing taking this photograph. Princes Street and everything to the north of that is the new town. And it was linked by things like the mound. And the mound was basically just a mound of rubble um, that they had dug up while they were constructing the new town. And they just put the, the rubble down and sort of made this link between the new town and the old town. Um, and again, this is usually very busy with traffic. I can see one person maybe walking or on a bike, I'm not sure. To the right of the picture where the trees are is Princess Street Gardens, which was a loch, like a lake, um, until it was drained and turned into gardens and just looking over it to the right you can't see it but the castle is right there um above the, the what we're looking at directly with the two towers that is the headquarters of the church of scotland which is our presbyterian church our protestant church separate from the church of england we've got our own kind of protestant um religion in scotland and then behind the kind of barricades on the left that the, those are up those white boards are up because there's a lot of work getting done to that building that is the national gallery um, so the Scottish National Gallery, which has our national collection of paintings up to and including the early 20th century. 
um, free to go inside. And again, that was closed during the lockdown. You couldn't go in. Uh, they've reopened now, uh, but you have to book a slot. It's all, everything's becoming difficult, man. Everything's difficult. You know, you want to go for a meal, you have to book a slot. You want to go and look at art, you have to book a slot. Uh, yeah, it's kind of, it's, you know, the library, if you want to go to the library, you've got to book a slot and then go at a, a certain time and you're only allowed 45 minutes to go in and get your books and get out again. Luckily, bookshops stayed, op mostly stayed open through the lockdown. Little Indies, independent bookstores did their best. So you could order from them online. They would either deliver to you, actually bring the books to your door if you were local, or you could go and collect and the books would be left outside. So they'd be left in a bag outside the door. You would have a time slot. They would put the bag outside and you would pick your books up. And people were desperate, man. People were desperate, A, for bookstores to survive. So, I mean, a lot of the bookstores, the, the small indies were saying to me, they were, their customers were so good to them. They were ordering a lot of books. Um, and as soon as bookstores reopened, they got busy because, again, people were just very keen to, to go back to bookstores and have them there. Uh, so that's been a kind of, you know, a small crumb of comfort amidst yeah. Yeah. complete chaos. I'm going to switch with Barbara here for a minute, but then at the very end, I'll come back and um, we'll talk a little bit about music, you know, and I, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm really missing uh, seeing live music and also, you know, here in Phoenix and all over the place, the, the fate of live music venues is really in the balance right now. So oh, we yeah, can talk, talk about, about that. that. And, uh, and also people watching on Facebook, I'll be monitoring that. So please start sending in your questions and here Barbara and I will switch. All right. Thank you very much. Hi, Ian. Thank you for holding up a copy of the book. American there they are. Edition. Yes, so that's indeed. American, that's the British. So we are ahead of the American edition, and therefore our They're books... the same inside. They're absolutely identical inside. Yep. Um, our books will not be here until Tuesday. And then Ian has very kindly signed a great many copies um, of the Orion edition, the British edition, which will be winging their way across the Atlantic to us. And we still have maybe 15 unreserved copies. So if you want an actual signed copy, I would recommend buying it now. So Ian, um, before I introduce you and all like that, and could I say, it's better if you don't wear your glasses because there's kind of a weird glow. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's cause I've put a little light, there's a little light over there to kind of, you know, I was told by television people, oh, that's nice. It kind of lights up one side of your face, but you're right. Yeah, you get this reflection of the glasses. It was like we were doing this underwater. <laughs> but in any case, um, I did I did circle. I read I read Ian's book in manuscript form, and so I have a couple of pages that I brought with me because while in general I don't think that translating Scottish English to American English is desirable, there were a couple of words, and oddly enough, you've picked them both up. So one of the words I circled was set. And now you've already explained to me what it is. Now, I do know from editing British authors that what we call a sidewalk, the Brits call a pavement. But I wasn't aware that um, cobblestones become sets in Scotland. It's if they're a different shape. I mean, if they're rounded, then they're still cobblestones. But a lot of the streets in Edinburgh, they're this rectangular or kind of brick shape. And those are definitely called sets. So and I made that mistake once and I won't make it again. <laughs> right. And the word tenement also comes up fairly often in the book. Among other reasons, Rebus is moving house, or not house, but moving floors. Um, he's moving from a higher to a lower uh, level uh, flat in, in a tenement. And I grew up near Chicago, Ian, so the word tenement to me means something entirely different than what you mean. So basically, it's, it's what, a set of flats or apartments? Yeah, I mean, in, in, in Scotland, you know, there, there, are, there are levels and levels of tenements. I mean, in Glasgow in the 1940s and 50s, they would have been very disreputable. There wouldn't have been indoor bathrooms and anything like that. Uh, they would have been fairly rough and ready um, buildings. But in Edinburgh, they, they were built for the middle classes. They were built to get a lot of housing into a small space, but do it in a kind of comfortable way. So... The ceilings are, they were built in, I would guess, well, late, no, hang on, let me think. Around about late 19th century, a lot of them date to high ceilings, big windows, um, you know, bay windows, uh, you know, nice big sized rooms. Uh, but yeah, no elevators uh, in any of them, which is Rebus's problem. 
So some of them, I mean, my son uh, lives in a, a tenement and uh, he's up three flights of stairs and I just don't visit, visit because I ain't going to try and climb three flights of stairs. So poor old Rebus, who's a bit older than me and has some health issues, I thought there's no way he's going to maintain staying in this, this second floor, second story. So it's two stories up. What America would call a second story, we would call, uh, yeah, we, what would that, we, that would be, because you've got, you've got one, one would be the ground floor, we call it the ground floor, and then the next floor up from that, it's the first floor. That's always another confusion with American English and English English. Um, so yeah, I thought Rebus has got to move, so he does. And bizarrely, haven't moved him out of the apartment he's been in since 1987 when the first book came out, because it is a real street in Edinburgh, and he lives in a real apartment in that real street. Um, a few weeks ago, someone flagged up to me uh, on Twitter that his apartment in real world was up for sale. Uh, and it was being advertised as such. It was being advertised as Rebus's apartment. And sure enough, it's 19 Arden Street, which is where he lives, second floor. Um, yep. And the front one with the bay window. Yeah, that's his, that's his apartment. Uh, I nearly bought it, Barbara. Uh, I toyed with the idea of buying it but, um, and setting it up as a Rebus Airbnb. Whereas you walked in, there would be a record playing on the record deck and there'd be a cigarette smoldering in an ashtray and the, and the sink wouldn't have been cleaned for a few weeks. But I didn't uh, do it. I'm amazed you passed the opportunity by, actually. <laughs> so the other person affected by the move, of course, is, is Rebus's dog, Brillo, who I have to say has a somewhat tough time in the song for the Dark Times, but we'll come to that. He doesn't, he's left kind of homeless, but Siobhan takes him in. <sighs> So um, I will now go back and introduce Ian, but I thought while the visuals were clear, we would just mention those couple of words. So A Song for the Dark Time is the 23rd John Rebus novel. I first knew Ian really when he was writing, or at least I knew him as Jack Harvey. I didn't know you as Ian Rankin. Um, we opened The Poison Pen in 1989, but the first Rebus, Knots and Crosses, Ian wrote it in 1987. Uh, when I first met Ian, he was a Chamber Fulbright fellow over in the United States. Um, and since then, he has, I mean, he's garlanded with awards. I'm not even going to bore all of us by reciting them all. Um, he's an OBE. He's the fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. He won in one banner year in 1997 with the, was that the 10th Rebus? Not um, Black yeah. and Blue? Eighth or ninth. I, I think, well, in any case, 10 years after Knots and Crosses and Black and Blue published, um, Ian won the Crime Writer Association's Gold Dagger for Best Novel of the Year. That's the British Award. And the Mystery Writers of America's Edgar Allan Poe Award for Best Crime Novel. That's the American Award. And then in 2005, he won the Diamond Dagger Award. And then as I say, it just goes on endlessly. So, yay. Um, it's a long way from Jack Harvey, you know. We've been together almost the entire time. Yeah, I know. I mean, one of the pleasing things about this book is that it's had a great reception. I mean, fans have been going onto Twitter and saying to me that they think it's, you know, if not the best Rebus, certainly up there is one of the best Rebuses or one of the mo ones they've enjoyed most. So that's absolutely thrilling to think that after, you know, Lord, yeah, you know, 30 years in this game and having written so many books about this guy, that people are still getting a real kick out of reading them. I mean, I got a kick out of writing this book. I was lucky in a way. I mean, I was lucky in several ways. Number one, I made a decision early on the book would be set not in the summer of 2020, but the summer of 2019. So COVID did not have to come into the book. It would have been a very different book if Reba's been locked down. Um, and number two, I got the research done. Almost all of the research was done just before the lockdown. The first draft of the book was finished in January. In February, I uh, headed up north. Rebus takes a drive up to the very far north of Scotland, up to the wilds where his daughter lives because her partner has gone missing and he wants to help or hinder the investigation. And I took that drive and I looked around and I found a village that I thought would suit the, the you know, could be the, the base for the um, story and such like. And then I came back to Edinburgh and lockdown hit us pretty much straight away. Um, so I was very lucky that I'd managed to do the, the bulk of the research. I, didn't, I hadn't quite done all the research. There's one thing that I couldn't research. And that was, there's a scene near the end of the book, no spoilers, but there's a scene near the end of the book that involves a car rental desk at Edinburgh airport and where the car rental cars are kept. 
I couldn't go to the airport to check that because we were in complete lockdown by then. I wasn't allowed to go five, more than five miles from home. And Edinburgh Airport is 10 miles from my apartment. So, what, so that had to be fictitious. That had to be me using my imagination. Everything else in the book is true. You know, I doubt very much that anyone is going to call you on inaccuracies at the Hertz rental car there. <laughs> yeah. But um, there, there are three things that I, I particularly loved about this book. One is, and we showed you those photos, is that one of the investigations, in fact, takes place in Edinburgh. A young Saudi um, is, is found killed in a very unlikely place. So we're anchored there, and that brings Malcolm Fox over from Gartosh because there might be, did I pronounce that right? Gartosh? Yeah, um, because there might be diplomatic considerations and so forth. So that sets up Siobhan and Malcolm to duke things out and other people. The other is that Rebus is not in Edinburgh and um, is clashing with the investigators up in the village that, that you mentioned, which we'll talk about. But the third, which was a complete surprise to me, although I don't know why, I'd never even thought of it, was the fact that Northern Scotland had World War II internment camps. And they had German and Polish among other, I don't know whether there were more nationalities, but at least there were a lot of German and Polish prisoners of war. And you know, Ian, we had one in Scottsdale. And one of the really great stories of World War II, which I absolutely love, is that we had one just south of the bookstore where those mountains are. You've been there with me. And um, they were a naval group. And so, so they decided in the spirit of, um, you know, escaping and so forth, they built, they built a handy boat. And their plan was to escape from the Scottsdale prisoner of war camp and in their boat and float down the Great Salt River down to the Gulf of Mexico and meet their escape. Of course, they were foiled by the fact there's no actual water in the Great Salt River, or at least hardly ever. But I thought of that, um, that, you know, it's always a surprise to find these bits of World War II still embedded, you know, mm -hmm. all over the world. Uh, even though the people, and in your book, it's true, they're at the upper edge of their lives. But still, you know, there are people still living who actually live through those, remember those. So what, what sure. interested you in the internment camps? Um, well, as you know, Barbara, uh, what happens with me, you know, how do I start writing? I start writing because I've got a deadline and panic sets in. And when panic sets in about six months before the deadline, I go to my big folder of ideas. Uh, and in my big folder of ideas are scraps of paper with ideas written on them, things I've clipped from newspapers and magazines, interesting stories or anecdotes, possible names for characters, things I've been told in the pub, you name it, all just chucked into this big folder. And sifting through it, there were two stories relate from clipped from newspapers relating to these internment camps, not POW camps per se, but internment camps. Um, and they were relating to books that had been written about them, about internment camps in the UK before and after World War II. Um, and these clippings were from years apart. There were four or five years between them. But I thought, why did I keep those? What was it about that that got under my skin? And so I read, I went and got the books out of the library and I read them. And I was astonished. I mean, t the internment camps specifically, because these were not enemy POWs. These were your neighbours. Uh, these were, this was the German delicatessen owner and the person who ran the Chinese laundry or the Chinese restaurant and the Italian pizza or fish and chip guy. And if they, if they came from a different culture or they had a, a slightly odd surname, they were rounded up and put in these internment camps. And there were thousands, over a thousand of them in the UK. And some of them were in Scotland. And some of them have been kept as memorials slash tourist uh, attractions. You can go and visit them and walk around them. And what, what clicked with me was the notion that in September last year, when I was starting to think about this book and what this book might be about, it seemed to me we were living through a pretty dark time in human history. With the rise of the far right in various parts of the world, with half the world seemingly on fire, um, with um, things happening in the White House, with Brexit on the horizon, with this and that and the other. 
just seemed to be a lot of chaos around. And that I thought the potential for us to go back to a political and social situation where we would be interning people again didn't seem so far-fetched, didn't seem to be so far away from what I was looking at around the world. So I found a way to, to explore that story. And um, so what I got was, I mean, I got, okay, these, some of these prison POW camps and internment camps were in the far north of Scotland because then the prisoners wouldn't try and escape because there's nowhere to escape to. They're a long way from anywhere. So I thought, okay, Rebus' daughter lives up there. What if Rebus has to go and visit his daughter for some reason and then gets involved in a story that involves an internment camp? Well, the easy way to do that was if her partner had been looking at the history, uh, he's a historian looking at the history of the internment camp near where they live, and he's gone missing. And I thought, that's it. Rebus jumps in the car and drives north because his daughter's partner has gone missing. And that allowed me to do several things. One, as you've said, it, it meant I was out of my comfort zone and Rebus would be taken out of his comfort zone because I'm not writing about Edinburgh. I'm writing about a long way from Edinburgh. Um, and Rebus is going to a place that he doesn't know, where nobody knows him. He's not a cop anymore. And in fact, the local cops say, look, you're a father. You cannot be a detective here. You've got to be a father. And that was the interesting moral part of the story for me, the, the, the internalized moral part, was is Rebus going to be a detective or a father? If he suspects his daughter had something to do with her partner's disappearance, will he be a detective, even if that means putting her away? Or will he try and protect her at all costs, even if that means fitting someone else up for the crime, framing someone else for a crime? So there was that. And I just thought, wow, that's a nice big moral argument for me to have with my characters in the book. So that was the Rebus stuff. Easy peasy. Easy peasy. But also had cuttings in that folder about Saudi business people, about Saudi royal family falling out with people and what happens if you fall out with the Saudi royal family. Um, Edinburgh has a lot of quite wealthy foreign students in it. I thought, okay, what if I've got a wealthy foreign student and he's been found dead in a party town he should never have been in? What happened to him and why? And that was it. I was off and running. I think the two stories are fascinating. I really love, now I, it's been a long time, but I spent some months in Scotland and I can remember driving those single lane roads with, you know, laybys for passing. Um, there's a lot of driving in Rebus's story. You know, it's hard for everybody to um, work the crime scene to get from where Samantha is to the crime scene and all the rest. Um, I thought it was interesting that, because um, I have played, um, I think, all of the golf courses in Scotland, or <laughs> let, me, let me go back and say that. When I was single at the time and I traveled with a gentleman who hit off a two handicap, as he said, and I determined uh, while playing St. Andrews with him that my game was not up to that, but I could caddy. And so I loved it. Um, I was on the bag and we did all of the courses. And so I was fascinated when you've got this character um, up there in the north with enormous acreage who may want to be building what you call an upmarket, and we in America will call luxury, but another mm -hmm. translation there, an upmarket, maybe golf course or some kind of a spa or something. So as part of Samantha's story, when Keith is disappeared, there's the possibility of some sort of um land grab or property grab going on and so i thought you brought in you know what are landlords to do what are landowners to do today you know people with vast acreage and what can they do can they really farm them anymore can they make them pay off agriculturally or do they turn them all into some version of you know a five-star marriott mm -hmm. well you know your 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 current president owns two big golf course resorts in scotland yeah. Um, one of them in a not very prepossessing part of Scotland up near Aberdeen. Um, so it happens. I mean, you know, people sometimes get a notion that they, they're going to build a huge resort hotel with a golf course attached somewhere in the wilds of Scotland. And people will, if you build it, they will come. The other weird thing is that they're trying to build a spaceport, i.e. a place where you can launch space rockets from up in the north of Scotland. And that is ongoing. And again, the landowner is in, uh, is in dispute with the local community over whether it's going to happen or not. It would bring jobs, but at what cost to the environment? Um, I mean, an awful lot of that part of Scotland, if, if anybody watching wants to Google flow country, F-L-O-W, the flow country, 
there are thousands upon thousands of acres of northern Scotland that you can't really do anything with. Um, it's basically one huge peat bog, and that peat bog is trapping an awful lot of CO2. And if you start to tamper with it, you will release a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere. Uh, and that could be disastrous. So a lot of it you shouldn't be touching, um, but there's not much you can do with it. You can build a road across it and drive across it and it's quite spectacular, but it's a very barren area um, and you can't really farm it. Um, there's not much in the way of it, not too much industry, so you don't really want to start building new towns and stuff up there. So yeah, I mean, um, Keith, uh, Rebus's daughter's partner it works doing a real job, which is dismantling a nuclear power station. There's a uh, an atomic nuclear power station called Doon Ray, which is up in the north coast of Scotland, and it is currently being dismantled, um, having gone past its useful lifespan. And that's the job that he's had for the last few books. And I just, I, at first, when I got the idea for the book, I thought that maybe the reason he'd gone he'd gone AWOL had something to do with the power station and him maybe finding out something. But then the story told me, nah, we've got this, this over here is what you should be looking at, this, this internment camp. That's, the, that's, where the, that's where the story is, not the power station. Well, I do think you did a wonderful job in taking this remote and, you know, largely underdeveloped area and then creating two or three scenarios where a crime, you know, could occur. So, um, you know, it's a complicated investigation, and it does bring um, officers from Police Scotland, you know, different jurisdictions coming. Um, and, you know, Rebus doesn't play nice with them. Um, well, I mean, never has. So is this in a way, Ian, I was going to ask you, because you referenced this in the book a couple of times, that, um, that Rebus has, um, ignoring protocol, gone off with some cold case files that he might occupy himself with, you know. Uh, so this seemed to me kind of a nice detour from that. I mean, he has an active case. He needs to um, to deal with Samantha and and Keith. But looking ahead, you have at least made us aware that you know he's got other things he can do, um, depending on what comes along. I like that. I thought you know it projects a nice future for him. But let's go back. Well, to I don't. Oh, and what kind of future has he got? I mean, I don't know. I mean, he's getting older now. I, I interviewed Lawrence Block a few weeks back, and he was saying he thinks he's stopped now. He thinks he's at an age now where he should be helping the planet save trees by not writing any more books. And uh, I was a little bit depressed by that because he's one of my favourite writers. Um, but how much more can I do with Rebus? You know, I mean, he's he's his his health is so bad now that he can't even manage stairs. He's had to move to a ground floor apartment. Um, and it ain't going to get any better. I mean, COPD, which he has, which used to be called emphysema, just doesn't go away. Uh, so he's in managed decline. That's what he's in, is managed decline. And yeah, I mean, this is a distraction for him. This is a, a nice distraction. He hasn't even told his daughter that he's moved apartments, you know? Uh, she has to find out. Um, uh, and she's so annoyed with him that he keeps that to himself. He hasn't told her. Because then he would have to explain why, and that would get her worried about his health. It's his thinking. So he's a complicated character, and I'm enjoying I'm enjoying this part of his life. I, it's a very interesting part of his life for me to write about, and I'm getting a lot out of it. But I don't know how much more I can do with him. And just as we were talking earlier, and you were talking about this very wild part of Scotland, I think one of the influences might have been, you know, fairly recently I read a couple of Jane Harper books, mm -hmm. and I just loved the wilderness, that Australian wilderness. Because whenever I go to Australia to do a book tour or a literary festival, I'm always in the cities. You know, there are a few big cities that are all around the periphery of Australia, the coast. But there's this huge interior that is there's very little written about, very little explored um, in, in literature or elsewhere. And I just thought there's an awful lot of Scotland that hasn't been written about. You know, the crime fiction, whether it's in the islands or the cities, doesn't really go much into the wilderness and there is a lot of wilderness out there so maybe the Jane Harper phenomenon was at the back of my mind when I took Rebus out of Edinburgh. Well it might and you know not not what I think you did in this book though you could continue which is um although Rebus is actively working with Samantha you have a, the heavy investigation in Edinburgh that's all Siobhan and Malcolm and other people so I don't know why Rebus couldn't be in his ground floor flat with Brillo restored to him and his files 
And the act of the heavy lifting part is still being done by these other people, but he would be over there in a position of mentor. Um, it isn't credible that he can be running around doing, you know, enormous athletic things or wrestling guys to the ground or whatever. But, you know, he definitely got, can't do that. But he's got a lifetime of, you know, of knowledge and skill and a contrary personality, all those things that we really like about him. And so you could make him kind of the stationary center around which the more active people can operate. And that's what yeah, I really he, think about the Edinburgh investigation in this book. Yeah, I mean, I mean, he could be like Ironside. So he's kind of stuck in his apartment there with his dog and uh, Siobhan and Malcolm Fox go off and do all the legwork, yeah. You know what, that was one of the nice things about the book for me again was getting Rebus away from Edinburgh it meant the Edinburgh investigation was Siobhan Clark and Malcolm Fox. And we got to see them working together and against each other. And it was a pretty successful pairing, I thought. I just wanted to see how they would be without Rebus stepping into the scene every now and again, because they could breathe as characters. You know, when Rebus is such a big character, that when he enters a scene, everybody else kind of disappears for the reader. He's the only one anybody's interested in. So it was nice for them to be able to hold their own uh, because he's not, he's left the building as it were. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, their relationship is very, has gone to some interesting places. Um, I liked the notion that Cafferty, the gangster who runs Edinburgh, now that Rebus is no longer around for him to play with, um, knows that he can't get his hooks into Siobhan Clark. She would be, resistant to that but he thinks that the weak link in the chain is definitely Malcolm Fox so he's going to try and turn Malcolm Fox um, and make him his plaything um, get him sort of giving him information and stuff like that um, so there's all kinds of interesting tensions there and uh, I like all I liked all of that you know it was a again i wonder if it was a lockdown but it seemed like a fairly fluid book when i was writing it i think it was such a great piece of escapism for me i could escape the day-to-day -day frustrations and fatigue of having to check the news every five minutes to see what was happening who was dying now how bad were things going to get um i could escape into rebus's world and escape into the world of these characters and it made it a joy for me to be sitting in this room. This is, usually I wouldn't write the books here. And this is Edinburgh, this is my um, office in Edinburgh. I've got two apartments in, in different buildings, adjacent buildings. Um, and this is my, this one bedroom apartment is my office. So this is where I write the books in this room, which is a living room. And then through the wall is the bedroom, which is now my listening room where I, I do all my, um, line the sofa and listen to records basically and then my wife can see if I'm working or not she can look through the window of our living room and look into the office here and she knows if I'm working or if I'm lying on the sofa um that was not well thought out when I bought this apartment but uh, normally I wouldn't write the books here to get peace and quiet I would go to our house in Cromarty which is a um a rebus kind of bypasses it on his way up past Inverness driving to the far north of Scotland um Cromarty is a little fishing village in the northeast of Scotland, basically the end of the road. Um, and there's no, there used to be no cell phone signal there, and we've got no TV up there. So I could lock myself away in complete isolation and get the book written. Well, I was able to mimic that with my apartment here in Edinburgh because I was pretty much isolated anyway. And also, I wasn't allowed to go to Cromarty. You weren't allowed to go more than 10 miles, uh, five miles, sorry, from your home during lockdown. Um, and so I wouldn't have been allowed to go to Cromarty anyway and, and do the writing. So, yeah, this is where this was the kind of nerve center. And I had all my photographs that I'd taken during my research trips and I had maps and um, books that I'd bought and stuff and notes. And I just surrounded myself with all of it, put the hi-fi on and started writing. What I did find difficult was reading. I don't know about you, but I found reading at the start of lockdown quite difficult again because there was so much information coming at you and misinformation and news and stuff and views. And, you know, you could, every five or 10 minutes, you would get distracted. You're trying to read a book, but you're distracted. I better check the news and see what's happening now. Has the situation changed? Has anybody died? What's going on? Um, so I was going to read Don Quixote. I was going to learn German. I was going to do all this stuff. And I found myself reading Maigret novels, you know? Um, comfort reads, short, fairly easy to read novels. Do you know when you and I talked in June, because we spent an hour or more together on Zoom in June, you were in fact 
contemplating doing a number of things. So this is an interesting <laughs> follow-up because I did, I did wonder um, how much of that, you know, it, it's the time where you either could be really productive or really distracted or some combination of both. But um, it is. Well, what I did, I mean, at the height of lockdown, what I mostly did, I mean, June, for example, what I mostly did was walk around Edinburgh and right. record it taking photographs and just rec and, and making memories of this city at its extraordinary time emptier than I'll probably ever know again in my lifetime. Um, but also I have started learning German. Um, I'm doing an online German course. I'm not doing terribly well at the moment, but it's slow going, but I'm doing it. And we got, the, we got our bicycles out and we started cycling, which I hadn't done in donkey's years, hadn't cycled in years. Um, I go running and I, I did that on my own through, again, the completely empty streets. It was such a mind-boggling thing to be running along the main shopping street of Edinburgh. Nobody there. No buses, no cars, no pedestrians, no shops open. All the five-star hotels boarded up. Just running past and thinking, what the heck? Well, there are a number of that were very heavy tourist trafficked that have actually rejoiced at, at having time out, um, you know, from, from mass travel. So, but I think after a while it becomes spooky rather than delightful. So, you know, who knows? Well, I mean, how but you're always, I mean, you know, if you're, if you're always thinking of the economic cost. Yeah. I mean, it's all very well for me. I'm a writer and I've got some money in the bank. Um, my job isn't necessarily on the line. Um, some of the creative industries, if you're an actor or a musician, I think it's much harder than being a writer. Um, publishing seemed to keep going during the lockdown. As I've said, indie bookstores tried to keep open as much as they could and people could order books online and pick them up and all the rest of it. Um, that wasn't too bad, but I was always very aware, you know, that, that things like the bar that I used to go to, which is tiny, the Oxford bar is tiny. The notion of you being able to socially distance in the Oxford bar is lunatic. So yes. whether or not, I mean, it did reopen, but it was not the same place. And it was only reopened a week or two, and then it was closed again. Um, and whether it will ever reopen, I don't know. Some of my favorite bars, as you know, are kind of small, intimate places where you stand at the bar and you pick up stories and gossip and you chat to anybody who comes in. That just ain't going to happen. Now it's all table service. You've got to be, you've got to be sitting at a table and you can't stand at the bar. And if a bar is, is too small, you can't even sit. And, you know, you just they can't open. So I was very aware of all the people in these um, hospitality industries who were going to really struggle. Um, so although it was a privilege in some ways, it was a fairly desperate privilege because I was very aware of all these people who didn't have jobs to go back to or might not have jobs to go back to. So there's one other thing I wanted to mention before I swap places with Patrick and you two geek out on music. Um, but um, we, we talked to Val, we, we had a Val McDermott, a very nice conversation with her last week when her new book, Still Life, um, published here in the United States. And we were talking about the fact that she grew up in Fife and then um, in a really kind of unlikely transition, you know, went down to Oxford and attended St. Hilda's and has done very well as, um, with her writing career. Um, and as I've known her, has moved gradually back north from London, mm -hmm. Oxford, to Manchester, you know, to Northumberland, and now back in Edinburgh. And then when I was looking at your biography today, just to remind myself, you know, I thought you did it differently. You know, you were born in Fife, but you went to the University of Edinburgh. You didn't go south as Val did. And I really loved, I really loved the idea that, um, your mentor, who is Alan, Alan Massey, right, was somebody mm -hmm. that you studied with, said something to you when you were thinking that maybe your first book or two were mainstream novels. And he said something, I hope I have this right, about do you think that John Buchan ever asked himself, you know, what kind of book he was writing or did he just write? And, and it made me wonder if, you know, when he wrote, um, oh, what's his spy story? I'm going 39 on. Steps. Thank you. When he wrote the 39 Steps, did he think, you know, it was the spy story? Was he really just writing in that whole Scottish adventure school, you know, like Stevenson and so forth? I mean, now we think of the 39 Steps if we want to place it as a spy story, but I don't think, I don't think he was thinking of it that way. I think he was just writing a grand adventure in that kind of wonderful Scottish tradition. So, you know, 
don't you think your books are really kind of the same? I mean, you know, I don't like categorizing books. And even though we started as a crime bookstore, we haven't really been a crime bookstore for years and years and years. You know, we do all sorts of things. I don't really think of you in a very narrow sense, a crime novelist. I think of you as a novelist. And, and you've written other books besides Rebus, quite a few in short stories. So what do you yeah. think? Well, um, yeah, I mean, uh, to go back to John Buchan, I mean, he is an adventure writer. Um, he's writing adventurous stories um, in much, I would say, in, in the, the, the tradition of Robert Louis Stevenson. If you go back and read Stevenson's Kidnapped, it's a proper adventure story. And although sometimes we think of it as a children's adventure story, it's really not. I mean, it's, and it's got lots of real history in it um, and real places uh, in it as well. And the same with Buchan um, that he takes on a kind of real trip around the UK. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, when I started off in this business, um, unlike most crime writers, I didn't read crime fiction. Um, I tried it when I was younger. My sister was a big fan of Agatha Christie, but I couldn't really get into Agatha Christie. And I left it at that. And I came back, I guess, because I loved American, the American novel and I loved American movies, American crime movies. And that kind of brought me to the American crime fiction, which is what I read really before I read much in the way of British crime fiction. Um, and when I started writing my books, it, I, I did think of myself as writing literary novels in the tradition of Stevenson and Buchan and writers like that who were really writing quite dark psychological suspense stories. Um, and if you talk to Scottish crime writers, you tend to find these names come up again and again. Stevenson of Jekyll and Hyde, the James Hogg of Memoirs and Confessions of a Justified Sinner, um, uh, Alistair Gray gets mentioned occasionally. Muriel Spark, who wrote one of the most mind-boggling crime novels ever written, um, The Driver's Seat, uh, a short, sharp shock of a book, which was a big influence on me. Um, all these writers are writing psychological suspense stories that are about human nature, about what makes good people do bad, about moral questions and moral ambiguities. The one character you get a lot of in Scottish literature, all of these writers have mentioned use it, is the doppelganger. Is the sense of the divided self, of people having within them, you know, more than one defined uh, psychology. So Jekyll can become Hyde. Um, Miss Jean Brodie of the Prime of Miss Jean Brodie is both the hero and the villain of that book. In um, Memoirs and Confessions of a Justified Sinner, the hero of the book, uh, the anti-hero of the book is a serial killer who is persuaded by a charismatic stranger that he's going to go to heaven, whatever he does, so he might as well commit murder on earth and kill his religious um, uh, uh, combatants, people who don't agree with his religion, perhaps. And is the stranger uh, a psychopath or is he actually a figment of this fevered young man's imagination? So again, it's a very Jekyll and Hyde story. And all crime fiction usually comes back down to that basic question of why do good people do bad things? And that's what you get in all these books. Why do good people do bad things? Um, so yeah, I think that is definitely the tradition I'm writing from rather than the tradition of Marjorie Allingham and Dorothy L. Sayers. And of course, the other question, and one that certainly prevails in this book is why do bad things happen to good people? So, um, you know, it's, it's the other side of the coin. This has been lovely, Ian. Let me switch over with Patrick, who may have questions from the audience, and then he can talk to you about your role as singer in the band, which I think oh, is Lord. All right. You're not going to ask me to sing, are you, Patrick? I just might. Um, you know, it's funny. One of the things, uh, we do have some questions from the audience, but there were a few things I wanted to ask you, too. Um, you know, one of the things in, the, in this new book that kind of came home to me was, you know, do, can cops ever really retire? You know, uh, you and, um, and actually Michael Connolly's Harry Bosch are somewhat mm -hmm. in the, the same stage in their lives. Uh, and he faces some of those same, those same challenges, you know, how, how can I really retire? Is it possible for somebody like me? You know, it's really interesting. I mean, whenever I'm, I hook up with Michael Connolly, which isn't nearly often enough, you know, we've known each other since pretty much the start of our careers. And it's been interesting how without us discussing it, our characters have gone in very similar. They come from very similar places. They're both ex-army, for example. And then they tend, they retired and they worked cold cases and have gone back into the police and retired again. Um, 
Uh, so without us ever really discussing it beforehand, we've taken our characters on kind of similar journeys, I suppose. Um, yeah, can I mean, do they retire? I don't know. I hang out with a few retired beat cops, not detectives so much, but beat cops. And they, I mean, they, yeah, they're retired, they're long retired, but they take, the, you know, when they get together, they tell the same stories. They tell stories about the job and right. they never get to right. telling stories about the job. It's like the job hasn't left them or the job can't leave them. Um, now, none of them work as private investigators or anything. They usually work in bars if they work at all, or they work as taxi drivers, cab drivers or something. Um, but I get a fund of stories from them. And I really miss that in lockdown because we're not sitting in bars and I'm not writing down all these great stories that I'm getting. Right. Now, let's see. Let's just, I'll ask you a couple of these character or these questions. Um, Kathy asks, uh, let's see here. Well, hold on a second. I got the wrong one queued up. Uh, Deborah Crombie's uh, watching. And hey, she, Deborah. Yeah, and she says uh, that she lived in Montgomery Street near Leith Walk. Uh, and she says, I think that is near Siobhan's flat. Is that right? Really close. Yeah. Um, what's going yeah. on? Yeah, Donna asks, uh, how's the progress of the TV adaptation on Rebus going? And will oh, Ken oh. Scott be back? Oh, God. Oh, geez. We have this discussion. There's a, a big newspaper here, the London Sunday Times, and people keep writing letters into it, to the TV pages saying, hey, when's Rebus going to be back on TV? And Ken Stott is the only Rebus and John Hanna was the only Rebus and this discussion is ongoing. Um, you know, the TV companies have had a, a two hour pilot script written by a really great screenwriter um, that would bring Rebus back. They've had it for over a year and they've not greenlit it yet. I don't know what is happening. Um, I mean, COVID hasn't helped anybody to make any decisions. But it's out of my hands. It's sitting in what's called development hell as we wait for somebody to make a decision. Um, there's been a stage adaptation, well, not an adaptation. I wrote a new Rebus play for the stage a couple of years ago, and that was such a big hit that I was asked to do another one. So I've, I've, before lockdown, uh, me and, another, and a playwright I was working with came up with a, a decent script for a, a new Rebus stage play. Um, but again, with the lockdown, that's all being put on the back burner at the moment. We're waiting to see what happens with that. Um, I'll tell you what did happen during lockdown was that I got a new actor to play Rebus. Um, I was asked by the National Theatre of Scotland if, if I would consider writing a short play about COVID and lockdown and everything else. And I'd been getting asked by people, what would Rebus be doing in the lockdown? Because obviously he's going to have to self-isolate because he's got health issues. So this allowed me to do a little 10 minute monologue of Rebus telling us how he's getting on with lockdown. And <coughs> National Theatre of Scotland said, we love it. And oh, hey, Brian Cox has, a, has, has agreed to play Rebus. So Brian Cox currently having a huge hit with Succession. Um, Dundee born actor, um, Barry Scotts. So he was in lockdown himself in a cabin in Upper State, New York. And he turned the cabin into a kitchen in uh, Edinburgh and he played Rebus and he even went and bought some dog food because <laughs> Rebus has a dog and Brian Cox does not have a dog but he went and dressed the set he got whiskey and he got a map of Edinburgh and he got some dog food and stuff and he did it and you can see it online hopefully even in the states I think you can see it online if you go to YouTube and you try looking up Rebus Lockdown Blues, wow. lockdown <laughs> blues and you should get this 10 minute thing which was a lot of fun and the stage that Rebus is at in his life now, he's not Ken Stott and he's not John Hanna. He's round about um, Brian Cox's age and, and he's going through what Brian Cox has gone through health-wise. Didn't you say once that, uh, well, and, and James Bond figures into this new book in kind of a tangential <laughs> way, but didn't you say once that Sean Connery had approached you and said, if I was 20 years younger, or something like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sean Connery is a, is, a, is a big fan of the books, and he was in Edinburgh visiting one time, and he he wanted to meet up. So I went to the house he was living in and met him, and he said if he'd been younger, he would have jumped at the chance to play Rebus. Mm -hmm. uh, and he had wanted to play another Scottish detective, um, William McIlvanny's Laidlaw, at one time. And did have meetings with William McIlvanny about him playing Laidlaw on television, but that all fell through. And McIlvany's Laidlaw books, huge influence on writers like me and Val McDermott and Denise Mina and various others. Um, a kind of taciturn Glasgow cop with a philosophical bent. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, if I'd got lucky, Connery could have, might have ended up doing it, but it wasn't to be, it wasn't to be, sadly. You know, in this yeah. new book, 
Harvard was saying at the beginning, you know, part of it is at the very beginning, you know, Rebus is downsizing. And uh, it's interesting that to knowing a little bit about you, uh, how these personal details of your life slip into the books. Because I know in the last couple of years, you've recently had to do that too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just, a just over a year ago, just over a year, well, no, yeah, a year and a bit ago, we uh, downsized from our very big Victorian era, so late 19th century um, house. Uh, in a very leafy suburb, two houses away from Alexander McCall Smith. My wife decided it was time for us to downsize. Kids had left home, uh, didn't need seven bedrooms. And um, so we moved to this apartment, this block, which is where Cafferty lives. So uh, I can basically look out my window and look up to a triplex penthouse and basically see or imagine Cafferty standing there, possibly with a telescope, pointing across the parkland outside towards where Rebus lives. And you can basically see Rebus walking his dog on his parkland, which is called the Meadows. So yeah, I've gone from living in the street that Rebus lived in to living in the street that the bad guy lives in. I don't know what that says about me, man. I don't know what it says. But it's part of the downsizing. I did the stuff Rebus went through. I, well, no, more, more. I had to get rid of half my LPs, half my CDs, half my books. The charity shops of Edinburgh, I've never seen such bounty, let me tell you. Um, and, and yeah, and a lot of furniture had to go. And I was very lucky the National Library of Scotland took my archive. So they mm -hmm. took 25, 30 boxes, big boxes of manuscripts, um, ideas for projects that never worked, rejection letters, correspondence. I'm the last generation of writers who corresponded, who wrote letters to each other. So there's letters from P.D. James, Reginald Hill, William McIlvaney, uh, Ruth Rendell, Colin Dexter, Lawrence Block, uh, Ian Banks, my dear departed friend. Sadly, a lot of these people are no longer with us. And, and all that remains is their side of the correspondence, because of course I didn't keep copies of my side of the correspondence. Um, you, so I've only got their letters, not mine. Did you correspond with Muriel Spark? I did not. When I was doing my PhD on Muriel Spark back in the uh, mid 80s, um, Alan Massey, who uh, Barbara mentioned, who was my mentor at university, he was a published writer who um, was a creative writer at the university. He gave me Muriel Spark's address in Rome, but I, I was too scared to write to her. So I only ever met her once. She came to Edinburgh the year before she died to give a talk and I went along and was able to meet her afterwards with my two big shopping bags of her first editions. Um, and she was very tired and not very well. So she just signed, I got her to sign one for me. She signed one book for me. And that was the only time I met her. Um, but it's not in this room, it's in the room next door. I could um, show you the table that she wrote Miss Jean Brodie on because my wife bought it for me at auction. Uh, Muriel Sparks' parents lived in an apartment in Edinburgh. When they died, her son took it on and her son lived there until he died. And when he died, the place was emptied and everything went for auction. And my wife went and bid on this small coffee table, occasional table, which was the only real table in the place that Muriel could have written the first draft of the book on when she was living in Edinburgh with her parents, because she visited Edinburgh and stayed with them while she was doing the research and starting to write the prime of Miss Jean Brodie. Wow. Um, just to squeeze in, we're running out of time here, but... Uh, uh, Kathy asks, uh, please ask Ms. Mr. Rankin if, if he's presenting at the 10th anniversary of Bloody Scotland in 2021. I have no idea. Hopefully. They've not asked me yet. They've not asked me yet. Um, I mean, the 2021 was nice because through the sheer delights of Zoom, they said to me, look, there's not going to be a physical festival. We're going to try and do some stuff online. What would you like to do? And I said, I would love to interview Larry Block, Lawrence Block. And um, because he didn't have to travel from New York to Scotland, uh, he said, yeah, no problem. I can just sit in my jammies and, and do it. So we had a great uh, conversation, um, me sitting here in Edinburgh and him sitting in New York and people around the world watching. And it was, it was a lot of fun. But they've not asked me to do anything uh, for 2021 yet. I, am, I was this year going to be the guest curator for the Harrogate. Um, the, the Thixton's um, crime conference, which is the biggest one in the UK, the best attended. And I'd lined up lots of great writers to come to that, um, some of whom I was going to get to interview. Well, 
that's been put back in total to next year and they've asked me still to curate it with as, as close to that lineup as we can keep, you know, depending on people's commitments. So hopefully there'll be a big chunk of that still happening next year. What happens with other, other festivals? You know, will the good Lord spare us? I have no idea. Yeah. We were going to, I won't subject our audience to the, the full extent of our musical nerd geek out set. <laughs> I'll keep those to our email, but um, uh, when you were here last time, or a couple times, you always have, a, uh, I think last time you had a photograph of yourself with Jimmy Page, and um, you know, through, through your own work, and I think, uh, was it Keith Emerson one time? I can't Yeah, remember. I don't, ca listen, I don't carry these around with me, they're just, they're on my phone. It's not like I carry photographs and go, hey, here's a photograph of me. No, 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 that's not what I was yeah. suggesting. But, no. but you were able just in to- case anybody thinks that's what I do. You were able to interview Van Morrison, and and your your own work has has you've had a lot of great opportunities to kind of interact with some of these figures, and I know you're a massive music uh, fan yourself. Um, what's going on with your own music? You're, well, you're nothing, band, right? nothing is going on because um, the band that I'm in, Best Picture, played our last gigs in December last year, supporting a band called Hipsway in Edinburgh and Glasgow. And we had a lot of fun. And we were just get we were so buzzy and so happy with those gigs. We thought, let's get back into our studio, let's do some rehearsals, let's get some more songs recorded. And then lockdown came along. Um, and we've had some unfortunate things happen anyway. Our bass player got a job in London and moved to London. Our keyboard player mm -hmm. left to join another band. Half my band are in another band um, called Fat Cops. And Fat Cops had an album out. And we're doing a lot of touring. So basically, just me and a drummer were left. Well, they were off touring, so we couldn't do any rehearsals at all. And since COVID came along, we've had no rehearsals. I've got ideas for songs. I've got lyrics. I, we, we've got a song called um, uh, called In a House of Lies that we were going to that we were going to play. We we're going to record and play. Well, I mean, I, I don't know. Will we bother recording that now because the book is now ancient history? A friend of mine, uh, a musician called Dean Owens, has just done a song called um, A Song for the Dark Times. And he's put that up on uh, YouTube and, and um, what's it called, Band Camp and stuff like that. You can go and listen to his song. And I, I did a gig with him in February. We did a, a Johnny Cash convention in, in Fife. Uh, long story, won't bore you with it. But um, as part of that, I said, oh, my next book is going to be called The Song for the Dark Times. And I went, what a great idea for a song. Um, and A Song for the Dark Times, um, I should say there is a playlist because it, it's called that because Siobhan makes a CD, burns a CD for Rebus, and it's the only CD he has in his car when he heads up north. So we get a lot of the tunes that she's recorded for him on this CD. We've done a playlist and we've put it on, I think, Spotify. So if anybody wants to go to Spotify and look for A Song for the Dark Times, they should be able to find a playlist there somewhere. I had a lot of fun doing that, as you would imagine. What kind of, what kind of stuff is on there? Stuff he knows and stuff that he wouldn't know. So, uh, hang on. What's on there? Uh, the Clash are on there. Jethro Tull, uh, James Yorkston, Steve Mason, Dean Owens is on there. John Martin, Mogwai, Orange Juice, Average White Band. Michael Kiwanuka, he, there's one, I think near the start, he says uh, there was a track that sounded like it had been beamed down from a funk club in the 70s. That's the Michael Kiwanuka. With, I don't actually mention it by name, but that's what it is. Black Sabbath, Good, the Bad and the Queen. There's one song he says sounds like it's about Brexit. He doesn't tell us what it is, but he says it sounds like it's about Brexit. And that's the Good, the Bad and the Queen. Um, Merry England. Uh, Blue Rose Code. Uh, great band, well, band, artist, singer from Edinburgh is on there as well. Yeah, that was great. You know what? The book wasn't even going to be called that. The book's original title was um, A Bullet to the Soul which is something that uh, Samantha says to her father, when you suspected me, it was like a bullet to the soul. And my publisher and my agent loved it. So I thought, shoot, I better put a gun in there somewhere. So a gun became an integral part of the plot. And then he said, no, nah, we're not sure about that title. So we started, and I said, well, look at this early title, working title, um, A Song for the Dark Times. It's a line from Bertolt Brecht. When the dark times come, will there still be songs? Yes, there will be songs about the dark times. They said, we love that. We absolutely love that. I thought, okay, well, in that case, I better put a CD, a mixed C CD in there. Uh, but meantime, the gun is still in there. So the only reason a gun was in the book was because the book was originally called A Bullet to the Soul. And then now it's no longer called that, but I've still got a bloody gun. <laughs> Barbara asks, uh, she asks about, um, there's a little bit in the new book where um, Rebus says he wants, to, he wants this, this line put on his gravestone. 
uh, he listened to the B-sides and she was wondering what's, what that's all about. I know, but you yeah, want to- she's, she's too young to know what B-sides are, right? Um, <laughs> it's like he's such a completist for his music that he not only listens to the A-sides of 45 RPM singles, he would turn it over and listen to the B-side just as intently, which is something I did when I was young. Um, and sometimes the B-sides were the best songs. They were the songs I preferred to the A-sides. Um, so yeah, but also, you know what it means? It also means that he's not looking for the obvious thing. He's always looking at a thing that isn't obvious. So the obvious thing on a hit single is the A-side. The B-side is just a bit of filler. But no, no, you can learn a lot if you turn it over and play the B-side. And I think that's the kind of deeper, that's the meta message in that, is that Rebus is a guy who looks for the kind of, the, the telling detail that other people would ignore. Um, just for, uh, before we sign off, um, and then I'll ask you just for a couple of recent, you know, records that you've, you've been enjoying, and then we'll sign off. Uh, Craig asks, please ask Ian if he has heard the new Arab Strack, excuse me, Arab Strap track, Turning of Our Bones. It sounds like something Siobhan might like. Yeah, I think Siobhan would be an Arab Strap fan. Uh, this is a, a, a Scottish band, basically spoken word with guitar. And the spoken word is mostly ridiculously filthy songs about teenagers um, um, having relationships and stuff and taking drugs and drinking too much and all the rest of it. Uh, disreputable man um, who sings it, um, Aidan Muffet. Anyway, it's a fantastic song. Uh, he's a great lyricist. He's an amazing lyricist. Um, it is just coming out now as a physical product. I mean, at the moment, all you can do is hear it online, but there is a physical 45 RPM single coming out. I've got my order in for that. Uh, I've, not, I've not been sent it yet, but I've got an order in for that. So yeah, I think, I think yeah, Siobhan would be, she loves Mogwai and she probably would love Arab Strap as well. Um, what I've been listening to recently, I've been listening to the new Sparks album, which is absolutely fantastic. I bought too much, far too much stuff in record store day, but I better not mention that, my wife might find out. Um, uh, what else? The American, the American band that's been around forever? Since what? the seven, Sparks? Which band? Sparks, yeah, Sparks, they're absolutely fantastic. They're the band the Beatles could have been. I didn't know they were Oh, come on. No, they're making better albums than ever, man. Their last two albums have been absolutely knocked dead. I mean, every track is a classic. And they're funny. The lyrics are funny. Um, Hippopotamus. Try and listen to the title track of their, not the new album, but the one before it, Hippopotamus. And just the lyrics are hilarious. You'll love it, honestly. Take my word for it. And musically, they're as fresh sounding as ever. So, yeah, you've got to listen to Sparks. Uh, what else have I listened to? The Michael Kiwanuka album, which just won a big prize here, is a fantastic album. Um, kind of 21st century soul album. Uh, oh, geez. I mean, just, you know, my, Dean Owens, my friend Dean Owens has been doing some good stuff recently. There's a guy called Erland Cooper. Um, you know, we're going to talk, well, we're going to talk, we've not got time. We're going to talk about gigs now, much we miss live gigs. Last night, there was a gig from the Barbican, which is a huge venue in London, and they streamed it. You could pay and you could watch it streamed. And it was this guy, Erland, E-R-L-A-N-D, Erland Cooper. And he's from Orkney, which is an island way up off the north coast of Scotland. And he does these really beautiful, almost Ennio Morricone soundscapes that involve the natural world, the sea, birdsong, you name it. And he's got a lot of classical instruments in there and him playing piano and stuff. Um, a little bit of spoken word, a little bit of poetry. And it was a gorgeous gig. I watched, sat in my living room on this laptop and watched it and it was just phenomenal. I do miss live music a lot. I miss playing it and I miss going to it as well. And I think, you know, live music is going to be one of the last things to come back from this because a sweaty venue where you're sort of rubbing shoulders with people you don't know and everybody's shouting at the tops of their voices and throwing beer around, that's not a safe environment for a virus. Yeah, I really worry about the venues too. I mean, we're losing a lot of them here in Phoenix and, and everywhere. But yeah, and the musicians, you know, without the small venues, where do, the, where do all the new musicians come from? Uh, yeah. It's desperate, and actors with theaters, you know, struggling, at, no actors are getting a chance. Ah, oh, geez, it just makes me depressed, man, which is why I love escaping into a good book. <laughs> what am I reading just now? I'm reading this just now. Uh, Pine by Francine Toon, okay. which okay. just won uh, the best Scottish crime novel award in the Bloody Scotland um, Crime Fiction Festival. Pine. It's just out here in, in soft back, paperback, whatever you call it. Uh, it's creepy. Very, very creepy. There's not a lot of crime in it so far but it is insanely creepy. It's like the best Stephen King. Have you read the new David Peace? I didn't even know there was a new David Peace. It's not out here yet, but I- uh, They've not sent me it, they've not sent me it. 
Uh, I mean, I get sent a ton of stuff. Is it really long? My heart sinks. Part of that, Tokyo, that Tokyo series. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, a long, a long time before lockdown, I had um, dinner with J.K. Rowling. A bunch of us went in for a friend's birthday dinner and I had dinner with J.K. Rowling. And apropos of not very much, I said, you know, as I get older, I like short novels. I like writing them and I like reading them. And she looked at me and she said, you're going to hate the next Cormoran strike. 900 pages. 900 yeah, 900 pages. pages. <laughs> well, I suppose we should take this in for a landing, but it's been such a treat to talk to you as always. And Barbara, do you want to yeah. sign yeah. off too? No, yeah. Patrick gets to sign off. I didn't take it. One of these days, we'll do a private Zoom, Patrick, and I'll give you a little tour of the music room. I would love, to, I would love that. That would be maybe. fun. So maybe we can set that up soon. And think anytime, about that. anytime. The last time you you turned, I went from Amandul and all that weird uh, late 60s, 70s. <laughs> and I asked Ian, what's next? And he said, magma. Yep. And so, you, so you can ponder what's next past magma. And then we can start our email exchange. Wow. Okay. <laughs> take, take care, Ian. Yeah, thanks, folks. Take care. I love it.